you made me realize when you were answering one of the questions from the audience, there are uh, some parts of resilience that we have that I would like to talk to you about first because I think it, it gives a deeper insight into this concept. And it's also something that the book really did for me because I was aware of the concept of resilience because it's also featured in uh, complexity science quite a bit. But what I had not yet really encountered is sort of practical advice as to how to make a society more resilient, especially uh, from the economic angle. Uh, and you already mentioned a little bit like the traps are an important part of that, of uh, avoiding traps is how you make your society more resilient. But there are some other uh, ways. I think you made some categories as, as to how to make a society more resilient, right? Yeah, so there are different aspects to it. So one aspect is, of course, in order to understand when a society is not resilient, it is often due to externalities combined with feedback loops. And in economics, we call this strategic complementarity. So it's like, if I do something, I cause a negative externality on you, Yuri, but mm -hmm. then you react to that. And your reaction is like a strategic, you react the same way. And your reaction then calls a spillback on me. And I will then do even more and I react to your spillback. And this we get in a feedback loop. So it's only if two of us, we already in the spill, a feedback loop. And then the situation is already worse. Uh, than before. I mean, we, we spiral essentially out of control. And, and the society should have a social contract to maintain this uh, feedback externality. So externality is already bad. We know this from standard economics. But if they combine with the strategic complementarities, then they're really bad because you, you get in a whole loop uh, scenario. Mm -hmm. and, and a big chunk of our social contract is essentially to avoid that. So I'll give you a very trivial example. It's like hoarding toilet paper. Yeah. I uh, I buy some toilet paper, then as you know, less toilet paper for you. That is, oh, I'm Marcus is hoarding toilet paper. You might hoard too. Then I have to I have to hoard even more because uh, Yuri is buying otherwise everything. And that's at the end of the day, people who really need the toilet paper they don't have it because it's all hoarded by a very few people. And that's just a trivial example, but we have such examples all over the place in the economy. And so we need some design in order to contain these risks of these uh, feedback externalities. And um, that's one thing. And then the question is, and that's not so in the book, but I'm thinking along this line. So how does it relate to a society which is designed from the top down versus a society which is like a Hayek and spontaneous order from the bottom up? So which society is more resilient in a sense? So you can have a, a society, there's a central planner who is like what we typically do in economics. We say, oh, there's a mechanism design problem and we design everything optimally and uh, I do this from the top down, so a social planner designing things. Or is it more like a society where things evolve like languages? No, nobody has designed our languages. That's Hayek's favorite example. Mm -hmm. uh, then in that case, what is more resilient? And my hunch is that actually a society which comes, the elements come from the bottom up is more resilient because you went through evolution through many, many shocks and things are not so symmetric. They are a little bit chaotic and complex. And sometimes this can make actually a system uh, which is less symmetric, less homogene homogeneous, uh, more resilient because it, it just reacts in different ways. Yeah. So that, that's one thing. But in more generally, how to manage and create resilience, I would say there are two aspects to it. One is to control these uh, feedback loops and, and externalities. And the other thing is to have a second uh, strategy to, to bounce back. So you have to have this two-prone strategy uh, in, in, in maintaining and containing uh, the, the shock itself and at the same time develop a long-run strategy to bounce back to the new normal, whatever the new normal might be. Yeah, And that, that's uh, the element. And, in, and communication is very important in that element. And there's some additional challenges if I jump into that about the communication. So put yourself, during the COVID crisis, was very difficult because you learn on the spot what's going on, how the virus reacts for a policymaker, and you have to design policy and then make decisions very quickly, not knowing in the fog of war essentially what, what to do. And at the same time, you have to communicate to people, and people typically have a hard time to understand counterfactuals. So, for example, if you do a lockdown and you see the number of dead people is not really going up dramatically compared to uh, previous uh, Years, so that's for example in Germany when you saw 2020, only in the fall actually 
dramatic increase of the number of deaths. Mm-hmm. But before that, mm-hmm. it was not extraordinary. And people say, oh, this, why? There's no problem. I cannot see a problem. But the reason why there was no increase of the number of deaths was essentially because there was a lockdown. But it's very hard to communicate a strategy saying, okay, we do a lockdown, we do, do everything uh, what we can do, and then you don't see the effect, but you don't see the counterfactual. What would have happened uh, if um, you would not have done a lockdown and the number of deaths would have skyrocketed? And that makes it more challenging. And paradoxically, a resilient strategy, or if you go for robustness, that's what you do. You make a lockdown, you block everything, and it's very hard to communicate. Yeah. If you go for a resilient strategy, you, the shock hits you first. So it actually makes it easier to communicate to the public. Right. Uh, like, yeah. oh, look, we are hit. We have to do something and we have to react to that. So a resilient mm-hmm. strategy has, in a sense, an easier way to be communicated to people who have a harder time to understand counterfactuals. So I think we saw that a little bit in um, Australia, perhaps, right? Where they were very successful at containment, yeah. at blocking uh, COVID infections. Uh, Australia, for a Western country, did. In, insanely well uh, in that respect, but then they had a very low vaccine uh, uptake uh, compared to countries like in Europe that was that were very hard hit. Yeah, you also see it within Europe, like Italy's vaccine uptake was way higher because they were hit early on very hard. Mm-hmm. That's because you know it's it's very it's a very good example because you don't see essentially yeah what the problem is. Yeah, so so if I could just try to summarize that a little bit, like uh, because uh, the people who are watching are, are are a lot of them are interested in economics and perhaps interested in a, in a sense in designing a society. And so, if you want to make your society more resilient, the first aspect you mentioned is to like you have these feedback loops. They they are they are very they they are resilient killers, is what you call them. I think yeah. they they are potentially are. So, for example, in a stock market, you can have uh, herding behavior where there's a run on uh, on stocks, a run on, on the on equity markets, or something, or maybe a bank run is even a better example. And that, and then uh, one way to contain that is to close the banks for two days. Uh, that's something they they often do, and and you know that doesn't always work, but it still seems to work actually some sometimes. So so that's if you build that into society on uh, for all different kinds of problems, you would have a more resilient society. That's right? correct. So it's like in the stock market, circuit breakers or yeah. bank holidays, as you say, that these are essential elements where you put in. Uh, these are small little things which can you know make sure that the feedback loop is not getting, the whole thing is not spiraling out of control. Yeah. It stops it, but then you also need something to come back, essentially. So you have a circuit breaker active, and then you also call people up and say, look, there's actually a cheap buying opportunity. Can you support the market? So the circuit breakers do two things. They stop the current trading, but then also there's a lot of activity going on to bring potential buyers in who haven't noticed all the price went up, down so much. Right. That's oh, where yeah. the bounce back comes in. Right. Okay, so, so let's say you have a catastrophic market collapse. Could you say that then, for example, QE might be used as a bounce back mechanism the, the way it was first used not not the way it's used now to keep on trying to lower inflation but uh, i think originally in the us it was <clears throat> as a way of uh, bouncing back right yeah so if you look at march 2020 essentially we had a catastrophic potential catastrophic uh, a decline of the us treasury now typically the us treasury is the safe haven where everybody is rushing into but everybody wanted to get in March of 2020, the international investors wanted to get out of the U.S. Treasury, wanted to get the U.S. reserves. Yeah. And the Fed intervened very, very heavily as a so-called market maker of last resort, trying to essentially buy a lot of U.S. Treasuries and issuing U.S. reserves. And that was one way to stabilize the whole situation. Without that, the situation would have become, would have spiraled totally out of control. So... Being a lender of last resort, or international lender of last resort, market maker of last resort, all of these tools, essentially, to a large extent, crisis containment tools, but you can also think and expand on them to be resilience tools as well by you know, emphasizing more the bounce back uh, element. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm happy you, you mentioned this, uh, this example because I think... It's often used in a financial stability uh, way, but it's also something, you know, I even got burned by that a little bit. Like at the start of COVID, I had US treasuries and I thought, oh, okay, well, you know, maybe we'll see the same thing at, as at the start of the global financial uh, crisis. But then US treasuries tanked. Uh, and later I found out that uh, 
you know, that was because of a dash to cash. So, so, so they went for yeah. even safer assets. And policymakers actually stepped in very rapidly, you know, having learned, I guess, like having become more resilient because of the experience of the global financial crisis, right? Yeah, so the reaction time was way faster during the COVID time compared to the global financial, because you could just undust your old tools, toolbox and just employ it again. And that's, that was actually very decisive action in the early phase of the crisis, which helped the whole global financial system. Otherwise, it would have gone way, way more dramatically wrong. 